The following program is brought to you by friends and partners of End Time Headlines. What's going on, everyone? This is End Time Headlines. It is Monday, March 28, 2022. It's a, about 15 minutes after 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. Again, if this is your first time joining us, in the comment section below, depending on which platform you are joining us from, be sure to let us know where you guys are joining us from and that you are new. Uh, we'd appreciate to hear from you. Um, before we get started on today's podcast, again, we want to encourage you to download our free app and subscribe to our main website. Again, intimeheadlines.org, intimeheadlines.com is going to be our main website where you can subscribe. You go to there and visit, hit the subscribe button get our daily digest or again download the free app or you can do both you can get the app available on apple it's available on android and it's free for your convenience and there's where you're going to find all of our latest headlines you can be notified every time we share uh, a new article and you can be notified of our latest podcast that will be available for your convenience to either listen or to watch or both at your leisure so today i'm going to be dealing with an interesting subject today I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> the Bema versus the Great White Throne Judgment. The Bema versus the Great White Throne Judgment. I, this is something that is more of a teaching than it is a prophetic update today or a prophecy update or anything in that nature. But this is something that uh, is going to impact every single human being, young and old, despite what ethnicity you are, what background you are, what denomination you're from, if you're affiliated with church or if you're not affiliated with the church, whatever. If you are alive and your heart is beating, it will impact you regardless. So we're going to get after this thing. I'm going to give you a verse of scripture here. This is Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9, 27, <clears throat> and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, somebody say the judgment, and that's what we're going to be dealing with today. We're going to talk about two different judgments. One is a judgment for the believer and another is for the unbeliever. So let's talk about, uh, let me talk about, we'll start out with the, the Bema. The judgment seat is known as the Bema, or the Bema is known as the judgment seat of Christ. So if you hear the word Bema, it's literally, this is a Roman term translated as a, as a court or tribunal. It is a word, again, describing a court or tribunal. And again, I'm going to show you some scriptures today and it's where it's referred to as the judgment seat of Christ. This platform, and I'm going to pull up an image here. This is why I pulled this up earlier. What you're seeing here on your screen here is, is exactly that. This platform can be either a public court or tribunal, or it can be private. Let me give you some verses of scripture to, to talk about this. The first one is John 19, 13. This one is a private tribunal. And it says this in John 19, 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, it's called Gabbatha. And again, this is the place called the pavement or in Hebrew called Gabbatha, but don't miss it. It's a it's a judgment seat or it's a platform where men and women were judged. Then we see a public display of this. And then this is in Acts 25, 22 through 23. And then Agrippa said unto Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. And they're talking about the apostle Paul when he is on trial tomorrow. He said, you shall hear him. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. So again, in Acts 
I'm sorry, John 19, we see a private tribunal. And then we see here in Acts 25, we see a public tribunal. But we know if you go back to John 19 here, eventually uh, it starts out in private, but then it, it is made public because Pilate brings Jesus out where he's brought before the people and he's raised up on this platform. So keep all this in mind. Now, the Bema, or this judgment seat of Christ, in the time of the Roman era was a tribunal for rewards. In the large Olympic arenas, there was an elevated seat or platform on which the judge of the contest sat upon. How many have ever seen the movie Gladiator? If you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, that's exactly, that's a really great picture of that. Remember when the gladiators were inside the Colosseum and they were fighting amongst each other. And then you, you had the men there, you had the king and they were all standing and they were sitting up on that tribunal or that platform and they were looking down. And if they were to make a, some type of a judgment against someone, they would bring them out in the midst of everyone. And then that's, that's kind of the picture of what we're seeing here. After the contest were over, the successful competitors would assemble before the Bema to receive their rewards or their crowns. Now, this is very important because when we start talking about the Bema of the believers and we say the judgment seat of Christ, we automatically think of condemnation or we think of something negative, but this is actually a positive thing. This is actually where rewards are handed out. And I'll explain more of that in just a minute. The Bema was not a judicial bench where someone was condemned. It was a reward seat. Likewise, the judgment seat of Christ is not a judicial bench. I want to clarify that. But listen, the great white throne, which we're going to talk about in the latter part of this segment today, that is a judicial bench where there will be judgment made. The Christian, our walk as believers is a race. Paul describes this. It's a race. I finished the, my course. I finished the race. I fought the race. Uh, remember, he talked about that. And the divine umpire, if you would, is Christ. When the believer's race is completed, every believer will be gathered before the bema or the judgment seat for the purpose of examining each one's life and giving the proper reward according to each. Now, let me give you some scripture on that. This is, if you're listening today by Spotify or Apple, we're pulling the scriptures up here for you. This is 2 Corinthians 5.10 and Romans chapter 14, verse 10. That's going to be where we talk about here today. Look at this. For we... Now, remember, the Apostle Paul was speaking to the ecclesia, to the church, to believers, not unbelievers, not the unregenerated. That's important. So when he, ref when he references we here, he's speaking to us. Those who are born again. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's that bema that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he or she has done, whether good or bad. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. This is Romans. The Apostle Paul wrote both of these, by the way, Romans 14, 10. He says, but why do you judge your brother or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So you, you guys see that? So there's two references here to the judgment seat of Christ. It's it, it, first to the church of Corinth, and then the church there at Rome. He, 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 reiterate, he reiterates there that there is coming a judgment or a reward for the believer and the deeds in which they've done. Now, let me give you some more scripture. This is 1 Corinthians 
chapter 3, verses 5 through 15. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 3, I'm sorry, 5 through 15. Listen what the Apostle Paul says here. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed. In other words, you are the fruits of their labor. As the Lord gave to each one, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So you see this, this co-laboring that is coming together here with two men working in the field with God, bringing about a harvest of salvation. So then, look at this. This is verse 7, 1 Corinthians 3, 7. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but is God who gives the increase. So in other words, he's saying don't boast about what you're doing for the Lord. You're merely a vessel or a conduit that God is working through in the earth. Now look at this, verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one, now this is where we're going here, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now stop. What is this in the context of? It's in the context of winning souls to the Lord. And Paul says by revelation of the Holy Spirit that there will come a reward for bringing people to the Lord or winning them to God and bringing them into the kingdom. He said each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So Paul will get a reward for planting the seed. Apollos will get a reward for watering the seed. Now, how do you, what does planting the seed, let me pull this off here and I'm going to talk to you for a second. What does planting the seed mean? What does that look like? Planting the seed is when you, when you witness the gospel to someone, when you share the good news with someone, when you let your light so shine among men that they may see your works and glorify the Father, which is in heaven, when you do, do good deeds and when you go about doing good and helping individuals, and or you're giving them, you give a track to them, you give a Bible to them, you invite them to church, and they get saved to church, you will be, get, all of heaven sees this, the angels of God see this, they document this, they record this, they keep the books in heaven, and on the day of this judgment seat of Christ, there will be rewards given out, and you will receive a reward. Now, who, what does it mean when it said Apollos watered? Watering the seed is you praying for them. When I plant a seed, come on, if I'm praying for it, and I'm going to use a good friend of mine, Daniel. He was a, 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 a dear friend of mine that I, that I sowed seed in, but I also watered it. And then I could, I could talk about another friend of mine, Steve, who I also had, I didn't have, the, the benefit of sowing seed in his life, but I had the benefit of coming along and watering the seed. Now, watering the seed is simply you're praying for that individual. You're interceding for that individual. You're equipping them. You're coming alongside and you're co-laboring with the seed that's already in the ground. And you are not aborting the seed. You're, you are watering the seed and you're nurturing the seed so it can produce the harvest, which again, is salvation so watch this the apostle paul said according to the scripture each one will receive a reward according to his own labor so i want to encourage someone out there that's listening today and watching today i don't know how many seeds you've sown out there i don't know how many seeds you've watered out there but don't grow weary and well doing just because you don't see a harvest now just because you don't see something happening now this is why the scripture says be not weary and well and doing and well doing or do, don't grow weary in doing good for in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Come on. Come on, brothers and sisters. Just because you got the seed in the ground don't mean you got to give up. You, you can't stop watering it. 
or the seed may be in the ground already, but you got to keep praying for them. You got to intercede with them. You got to keep living Christ before them because there is a, not only will you see an earthly harvest or an earthly manifestation of what you're doing and laboring, but there is rewards laid up for you in heaven. Look at this verse nine. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Now, what does Paul mean there? What he's talking about here is if someone came along and planted a seed in an individual of the gospel of Christ Jesus, sound doctrine, and then someone else comes along and they corrupt the seed or they abort the seed by bringing in a false doctrine. This is why Paul, the apostle Paul said, we have to be, this is, a, this is why teachers are held to a higher accountability and a higher standard and a higher judgment. This is why, guys, when I teach, if I question whatever I teach, then I'm not going to teach it or preach it. If I can't find it in Scripture, I'm not going to preach it. I'm not going to teach it because God will hold me accountable. So this is why he says here, let each one take heed how he builds on it. You better be sure that you are not sowing seeds of a false doctrine into someone. Now, now the problem you have with this, you got a lot of people out there that will call certain things a false doctrine when it's not. Or they'll call people false prophets when by definition, they're not false prophets. It's a lot of people. Listen, I'm going to say something right here. It's going to stir some people up. I have... What I've learned in 22 years of ministry is most people who are constantly accusing people of being false prophets, I come to terms to know, and I find out later that usually, not all the time, but typically what that interprets as or what that comes out to mean is that that individual does not care for them. It's not so much about what they preach or teach, but if they don't like them for whatever, they don't like their style of preaching. They don't like that they're on television. They don't like their hairstyle. They don't like that they have books. They don't like how they're in a certain denomination or they, they, they don't, they believe a different way. And it's never about, listen, it's never about the, 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 the core principles of Christ. Do they believe Jesus Christ is Lord? Do they believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again on the third day? Do they believe he came in the flesh and he died for us and he gave his life as a ransom? Do they believe in the cross? Do they believe in repentance? Do they believe in salvation? So if, the, if they've got these things right, guys, but they may be in a denomination that you don't like, or they some people believe, listen, there's some people that say, Everybody on Christian television is a false prophet, and that's not true. That's ridiculous. I'll tell you right now, if a slot came open for our ministry to be on Christian television and it was paid for in full, I would take it. Why? Because it's an opportunity to reach more people for the gospel. But you've got some weird mindsets out there, so we got to be careful with that. But nevertheless, I don't want to get hung up on it. I want to talk about this. Let me, let me go back here. But what I'm saying is, guys, just be careful when you do make a judgment against a brother or sister, make sure it's biblical and make sure it's based on something that is not your opinion or your like or dislike or your preference about them. OK, that's all I'm saying. All right. Now, here we go. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 3, chapter uh, verse Corinthians 3, 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay that that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Because every other religion is going to crumble. It's going to fall. It's, going to, it's not going to hold up. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, well, look at this. With gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work. Now, I know this stirs up a lot of brothers and sisters that don't like to talk about believers and work. 
They're hung up on. And listen, I believe that we are saved by grace through faith and not works lest any man should boast. I don't believe you can work for your salvation. I believe it is a free gift from God. But when you are saved, you work for the kingdom. You win souls to the kingdom. You preach the gospel where you're at, wherever your platform is. You witness to individuals. You live a life uh, set apart for Christ. You begin to walk out sanctification and holiness and righteousness unto Christ. You don't get saved so God can, listen, you don't get saved so you can go and continue in the same life that God delivered you out of. Hello? And I could completely destroy anyone who differs with that. I can go through the book of Romans and prove that. I can go through all of Paul's writings and talk about and show you where Paul emphasized that he died daily, daily, putting his flesh, crucifying his flesh, walking in the spirit and not walking in the flesh. And so he's not fulfilling, uh, he's not um, fulfilling that. And to bringing about death by walking in the flesh. But again, look at this. He says, everyone's work will be revealed and it will be clear for the day. Somebody say the day. The day will declare what day? The judgment seat of Christ, the Bema. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So here's the bottom line. And let me, let me read the rest of this. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Did you hear that? Did you you got to hear that last part there. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved as yet though through the fire. So we're not talking about a, a salvation issue here. Because listen, you won't even make it to the Bema seat or the judgment seat unless you are saved. So that's not the issue here. The issue here is the rewards that will be handed out, what you're doing for Christ, what you're doing for his kingdom, will it stand the fire? And if it stands the fire, will it come out as precious gold, silver, or precious metals? Or will it be wood, hay, or stubble and burned up? Now, how could it be? How could your works and your intents for God be burned up? Because perhaps it's ill motive. You have an ill motive intent. Your intent is for dishonesty. It's for popularity. It's so you can get more followers. It's so you can get an earthly gain and notoriety. And you're fleecing the, the, uh, the flock. You're taking it. You're, you're propagating the gospel for dishonest gain or whatever. And the list goes on and on and on. You're taking advantage of people. You are, come on, you're, sexually molesting people you're causing them to sin in the name of christ and remember the bible where the bible says that many shall come unto me on that day and he'll say depart from me i never knew you so there's going to be a lot of individuals this is a scary part right here there's going to be a lot of individuals that's going to be secured there and they're, they're going to be believing that they're going to stand before this judgment seat of rewards but they're going to not, they're not even going to make it here. They're going to end up at the great white throne judgment. And then God is going to explain to them why. And he's going to say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And then they're going to testify and say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not heal the sick in your name? Did we not do great things in your name? But he's going to say, and he, but he's going to call them a worker of iniquity. They profess to know Christ. They publicly, they did things in Christ's name, but in private, they were a completely different individual. 
They practice adultery. They practice abominations. They led people astray. They were liars. They were uh, they were murders. They were and, and the list goes on. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the great white throne judgment of this. Don't miss it. The participants in the judgment seat of Christ are members of the New Testament church. These are individuals who have trusted Christ as their Savior from the day of, of Pentecost until the coming of Christ for his church. Uh, it does not include the Old Testament believers because they were already, remember they, oh, I don't even, I, listen, if I get into this, it's going to take another 45 minutes, but they were judged under the law of Moses. They when they died, they went into an underground chamber in the center of the earth called Abraham's bosom. You can find that in Luke 16. There was a compartment under the earth called Abraham's bosom, and it was separated by a great gulf fix. And above was Abraham's bosom. Below was Hades or hell. You can read about that in Luke 16 in your own time. And there was a separation of the righteous and the unrighteous. And then when Christ was crucified... And he gave up the spirit. The Bible says he took the thief with him. He went down, according to the Bible, he first descended before he ascended. And he went into the lower parts of the earth and he preached, he preached to the captives and he led captivity captive. He led all those out of Abraham's bosom. And the Bible said that there was a great earthquake when he was crucified and the graves of many were opened and saints were seen about walking in the streets. Who were those saints? Those were the ones, those were the first fruits uh, of uh, under, uh, they, those were the ones under the, the law of Moses that was resurrected with Christ when he came up with him. And you say, where did they go? They came out of the grave. I believe Acts chapter one tells us that when Christ ascended unto the clouds, those saints went with him and they are currently with him. Second Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul said, I know a man, uh, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, but he was caught up and went into the third heaven, and he's talking about paradise, and it's located under the throne room of God. I told you I shouldn't even open this can of worms. It's You can find that in the book of Revelation, and it's currently present tense. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We The righteous no longer go down below, but the righteous go up, and they're seated, and they're waiting under the throne room of God, John saw them. He's in it's his writings in the book of Revelation, and they are resting. They, the ones that are killed during the tribulation and make their robes white, they will also be there until the end of all things is fulfilled. But what happened to Hades? What happened to Abraham's bosom? Abraham's bosom just changed locations. It was moved from below in the center of the earth to paradise, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And then the Bible says, Isaiah says that hell enlarged itself. So now when individuals die who do not have a covenant with God, they don't go up, they go down into a lower chamber of the earth called hell or Hades. And this is a temporary confinement, and they will eventually be released to be judged at the great white throne judgment, which we will talk about in just a second. Everybody take a deep breath. Everybody, just give me just a second. That was a lot. I, I gave you in 10 minutes what, what should take an hour to preach or teach on. We did a whole teaching on this. You can find it on podcasts. You can find it on archives on YouTube. And I go into great more detail than that. But nevertheless, there will be rewards given to believers at the beam of judgment. The foundation in which Paul is speaking of here is the foundation of the cross or the atoning work of Christ and his teachings. This was the core foundation of the churches that were established through the apostle Paul at, the, at this future Bema, judgment of Christ, all believers will be judged based on words and works. It will be judged by fire. Again, I, we brought that up. Re, and the rewards will be given to believers if they abide and remain. Now, what are they going to do? These rewards will be crowns that will be given out. Now, what are we going to do with these crowns? Well, I can tell you, according to the book of Revelation, 
the 24 elders, they cast their crowns before, come on, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So we as believers, this is why it's essential that we get rewards or we get crowns so that we can lay them down at the feet of Christ. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but I, I want to be a participant in that. This, uh, the apostle, or I'm sorry, David said, and that you, O Lord, are loving. Surely you will reward each person according to what he has done. Matthew 16, 27, for the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what he's done. Did you see that? That's Matthew 16, 27. Now, I want to shift gears, and let me pull this off here for a second. I want to go to the book of Revelation chapter 20. So everybody understand the Bema, or the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, this event happens in heaven, not on earth. Here's something else that's going to stir up another debate, and it's going to happen during the tribulation. While all hell's breaking loose down on the earth and people are going through the tribulation, the church is in heaven, Revelation 4, and we're not mentioned anymore from Revelation 4 on. Why? Because we are at the Bema or the judgment seat of Christ getting our rewards handed out to us, and then we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven while all this is taking place on earth. But then when it's over, when you get to the end of the tribulation, Christ, according to the book of Jude, he's going to come out of heaven with ten thousands upon thousands of his saints. So he comes back to the earth to set up his kingdom for a thousand years and rule and reign with us, guys, the saints. Hallelujah. So here, that is the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema. But then we get to a different type of judgment. And this is Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 15. Now I want to pull this up. I'm not going to read all that. You can read uh, 1 through 10 on your own time, but I'm going to start at verse 11. Look what John says he saw. Ready? John, I'm sorry, Revelation 20, verses 1 through 15. Then John speaking, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. This is Yeshua. This is the Lord sitting on the throne. And there was found no place for them. And I saw, look at this. And I saw, I'm going to read this. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. By the way, we did a whole teaching on podcasts. And it's available on YouTube. And I believe it's on Rumble. And we talked about the five books in heaven that most people do not know about. And that one got a lot of people flustered. And they didn't even bother listening to it or watch it. And they immediately called me a heretic. But then I proved to them in scripture that there is five books in heaven. Five books. You have to go back and read that. Anyway, these books, look at this. God says these books were open. Well, there's only one book, brother, and it's the book of life. You're either in it or you're not. Well, I'm going to let me just read this to you again. John said he saw books, plural tense, and they were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. So wrong. There is more than just the book of life. Again, there's a whole. The problem is, guys, listen to me. When someone tries to teach certain doctrines, or I should say traditions, they will contort scripture to fit their tradition and they will ignore scriptures to contradict, teach contradictory to that. I had someone tell me, 
Bless God, once your name is in the book, it cannot be blotted out. Well, that's funny because I can go to the Old Testament and it talks about the name can be blotted out. And then I can go to the book of Revelation and it says that your name will be blotted out if you add or take away anything in this book. And it's right there in scripture. And you try to show them this and they get angry and they get mad and they shut you down. They don't want to hear it. So what are we doing today? I'm, I'm showing you scripture. So if you... If you don't agree with some of this stuff, you're just you're disagreeing with the word of God. Again, there is books, plural tense, and then there's another book, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to the works. This is not believers. Believers have already been judged at the Bema. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it. Ready? And the dead were judged according to the works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. Hello, the righteous are not in Hades. When I listen, if you're serving Christ and you're in Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I you're not in hell. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Look at this. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And here's the key, guys, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Again, if your name was not found in the book of life, you would not be at the judgment seat of Christ to begin with. Context is everything. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians was addressing believers, not unbelievers. This final judgment, this right here, my friend, is where every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm talking about Hitler's going to be standing there and he's going to bow his knee and he's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm telling you, Saddam Hussein is going to bow his knee and he's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm telling you, every wicked murderer, every wicked pedophile, every wicked adulterer, every wicked liar, every terrorist, every individual that renounced Christ, denied Christ, that every individual that fits the bill, whose name is not found in the Lamb's book of life. I'm telling you, every wicked, perverse organization that we have on this earth that promotes the shedding of innocent blood, that promotes abominations, and that promotes all that nonsense, they will stand before this judgment called the great white throne judgment, and they may have cursed God on this side of heaven, but I can tell you one thing, when they get to this great white throne, they are going to bow their knee, and they're going to say, Jesus Christ is Lord, whether they like it or whether they not. And let me give you some scripture for that too, for everybody. Well, I don't believe that either. Philippians 2, 9 and 11. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him who Jesus and given him the name, which is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven this is angels or saints that have already died in him. And of those on earth, those that would be alive during the 1,000 year millennial reign, when this, at the end of this, when the great white throne judgment takes place, and of those under the earth, this is hell or Hades for those who have died and that are in hell right now, waiting. They're, don't miss, don't understand, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. They're being tormented. The Bible says it's the, the worm dies not, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's burning. Luke 16. The man, the, the rich man said, Please send Abraham down here so he can cool my tongue in this flame of torment. It's not, listen, hell is not a metaphor, it's not an allegory. It's not a parable, and it's not make-believe and mythology. Hell is literal. Heaven is literal. 
Let me go back. Let me pull this back up here again. Look what he says. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians 2, 9, and 11. Now listen to me. I'm going to blow your mind on something else. Did you know that entire nations will be judged and they will stand before this great white throne judgment? Let me give you that. That's Matthew 25, verses 31 and 46. Now, this is too much to put up on the screen, so you're going to have to listen to me. You could, If you have your Bible, you can turn there. It's Matthew 25. I'm going to start at verse 31. Again, Matthew 25, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations, I said, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats will be placed on his left hand. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he goes on, he says, for I was hungry and you gave me food and thirsty and you gave me drink and I was a stranger and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me in prison and you came and visited me there. And, the, and then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we do this? And he say, as much as you've done it to my brother and you've done it also unto me. Now look at this. But then he will say to those on his left, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was a stranger, I was in prison. You didn't feed me, you didn't clothe me, you didn't, you didn't give me drink, you didn't do any of these things. And as much as you didn't do it to them, you've done it directly to me. God takes that personal. Now look what he says here in Matthew 25, 31 and 46. And these who, the ones on the left, nations, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. So for all the individuals that complain about America, why does America always get involved in the affairs of other nations? They're always trying to stick their nose in everybody else's business. They're always trying to provide help. They're always trying to provide relief. They're always trying to provide food. They're trying to provide shelter. They're trying to provide water. Listen, I, as an American, am thankful that my, the nation that I represent or that I'm a citizen of is fulfilling this by giving to the poor, helping the needy, helping the orphans, and doing these things. Is America perfect? No. Do we have government corruption? Absolutely. Do we make it all right all the time? No. By not by any means, we miss the mark. And because leaders lead us astray, but I'm talking about as for the most part, America has been, been one of the most giving nations in the world. And I don't know about you, but that's a big deal to me. Now, Watch this. This now this we're going to go to a whole other level here. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. The, at this judgment, uh, I'm sorry, at this great white throne judgment, you ever wondered what the saints will be doing? Us? Look at this. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Did you know that? You and I will help judge the world. And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Look at verse three. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Did you see that? Saints, come on, somebody say this with me because you got to get this. Saints will judge the world and saints will judge angels. Now, what angels are they talking about? They're talking about, the, in Jude 6, look at, the, look what the writer of Jude says, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, that's in heaven, these are the ones that rebelled against God, and they aligned themselves with Lucifer, but they left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Wow. So look at this. Fallen angels that were cast out of heaven, bound in chains of darkness and hell, will be brought out and judged by us. 
they will be judged by the saints. Again, I don't know if I believe that. I just showed you scripture for it, guys. They will be destined for eternal damnation and be cast into the lake of fire. Here's the crazy part. This implies that there has to be some type of records, hello, books, being kept in heaven of the acts and deeds of even these angels in order for them to be judged properly. So God's going to pull out these books. And because God is a righteous judge, these angels shall be brought out and be judged by the saints. And we are going to be reading from these books. And each one of these angels, and by the way, if you want to know who these angels are, go to read the book of First and Second Enoch. Uh-oh, thought I'd make some more people mad. And I can't believe he's promoting books. They're not found in the 66 books of the Canaan Scripture. And I don't want to get into that. I call it Jewish history. But if you go to the book of 1st and 2nd Enoch, there's these angels are named, these chief angels. But, it, but nevertheless, they're going to be judged. And God is going to reveal exactly why they are doomed to hell. One, because they rebelled against God and they took alliance with Lucifer. But apparently there's going to be more things involved in that. And don't even try to ask me to explain that because that's, I don't even, that's way over our head and that's above my pay grade. But look at this. So the saints will judge the world at the great white throne judgment. These will be the unrighteous and ungodly that will be judged. So we will be helping with this. We're not going to be sitting on some clouds playing a harp, you know, all day long, just sitting on a cloud, floating along, playing a harp and dipping our feet into the river of life. That's all a bunch of baloney. That's not going to happen. We will be, do, we will be kings and priests and we will have functions. We will have, we will have uh, occupations. We will be doing things even in the millennial reign of Christ. Now, let me give you some more verses on this great white throne judgment and the judgments that are coming. Look at this. This is Matthew 11. We're almost done, guys. We're going to close right after these two scriptures here. And then we're going to pray for some folks. Matthew 11, 23 and 24 and Matthew 12, 41 and 42. Let me say it one more time for the folks that are listening and not watching. Matthew 11, 23 and 24. And then we're going to go to Matthew 12. 41 and 42. Look at this. Jesus speaking. He's speaking to Capernaum. He says, oh, and you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Look what he says in verse 24. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, is he speaking about the Bema or the judgment seat of Christ? No, he's speaking about the great white throne judgment, Matthew 25. The men of Nineveh in Revelation 20. I believe, was it Revelation 20? I want to make sure I got that right for those listening and not watching. Yes, Revelation 20. All right. Then Matthew 12, 41 through 42. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed a greater than Solomon is here so you see here that there is an emphasis on this judgment that's coming to nations a judgment that's coming to angels that revolted against heaven a judgment against all great rich poor small regardless of what ethnicity, what background, whatever. All of us guys are headed to one of two judgments. So today, this is what I want to end with. I want to make sure, because on my watch, let it not be said of me 
that I did not give anyone the opportunity to make things right with God, to get their name in the Lamb's book of life so that they can be found written in that book. So that, listen to me, friends, really clear. You do not want to be at the great white throne judgment. You and I want to be found at the judgment seat of Christ, the beam of judgment where we are given rewards and not condemned unto eternal everlasting fire. So you say, and you're listening to this today and you say, well, brother Ricky, how do I make that assurance? It's simple. You receive the free gift. The book of Romans says, if you believe if you believe on Christ, if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, if you believe on him and your heart and you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Bible says you shall be saved. So right now where you're at, if you're watching, if you're listening and you don't have a relationship with Christ, You've never, you've never said yes. You've never accepted him into your heart. I want you to repent of your sins where you're at. The Bible says if you confess your sin before him, he is able and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He can wipe your slate clean. He can forgive you of your sins. He'll put your name in a Lamb's book of life. And the Bible says that all of heaven, you may not be able to hear it right now. You may not be able to see it right now. But if you say yes to him today, all of heaven will rejoice. And even the angels of God will rejoice in heaven over one sinner that gives their heart to the Lord. So friend, don't put it off today. Repent where you're at. So just It's simple. Listen, I'm going to pray a prayer and you can repeat what I say or you can pray your own prayer. I, there's very few times I say repeat this after me because I want it to come from your heart. But I'm going to lead everyone in a prayer today. And listen, if you've never known the Lord or if you're backslid today, you're not right with God and you know you're not right with God today, now's your chance. We're going to pray right now. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, I come before you today and I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask that you to forgive me of my transgressions, my iniquities. I ask that you would wash me in your precious blood today. Lord, I thank you that you died for me on the cross. You made atonement for me on the cross. Lord, I thank you that you made a way for me to go and be where you're at. And Lord, I thank you that from this day forward, I choose to serve you, not just me, but I choose to serve you with my whole mind, heart, soul, and strength. I choose you as for me and my house, my wife, my children, we choose to serve you, to follow you, to put our faith in you, and to put our trust in you. Today, Lord Jesus, I renounce all ties and connections with my former life, whether it be uh, addictions, whether it be soul ties, I renounce any kind of perversion, I renounce sin, I renounce false gospels, false doctrines, cults, witchcraft, sorcery, new age, I renounce all these, I renounce the kingdom of hell and Satan himself, and today I embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven. Today, I say yes to the Lord. And today, and from this day forward, Lord, I pray that you would lead me, that you would direct me, and that you would guide me, and that you would order my footsteps. You would show me the church I need to attend to. You'll show me where I need to be a part of. You, I thank you, Father, that you're going to speak to me when I read your Bible or speak to me through a word. That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word that you are going to instruct me and lead me and guide me all the days of my life. And I pray this today and I believe it. And it's in Jesus name, I pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Listen, friend, regardless on which side of the tracks you're on, if you, if you prayed that prayer with me or something similar to that, we welcome you to or back to the kingdom of heaven in your rightful place. Listen, remain strong. Keep enduring until the end, whatever that looks like for us. Some of us, we're going we're gonna to die in the flesh and 
we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 12 and wait until the end of all things. There, I believe there could be a generation alive and well, and we are going to be caught up in a moment in a twink of an eye. But listen, whether you go here, you go there, or you go in the air, the key is to endure. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So we got to endure, we got to persevere, and we got to just got to keep on keeping on. You got to get in that word, get in the devotion, get in prayer, get get in, in a Bible believing church. If you don't have one, we welcome you to our community right here online. We're going to equip you. We're going to feed you. We're going to inform you the best that we can. Get connected with other believers online on Facebook or Twitter or all these other social outlets, media outlets that we're connected with as well. So guys, again, we appreciate you making that very important decision today. And as always, guys, if this ministry is a blessing to you and encourages you, it informs you, it equips you on a weekly basis, we just want you to pray about becoming a monthly partner so that we, listen, your support helps us to remain strong, helps us to remain active, helps us continue to do what we're doing. The subscription base is free. The the uh, the podcast is free. The messages are free. Everything is absolutely free for everyone. There's no charge. All we ask is that you pray about. We don't manipulate people here. You pray about what the Holy Spirit puts on your heart, whatever your relationship is with our ministry, you pray about it and you can partner with us on a monthly basis or you could do a one-time gift, whatever the case would be. Uh, we appreciate your support to this ministry. You can do it two different ways. You can give electronically through the app or through the main website, or you can give by check or money order and you can make that out to End Time Headlines, P.O. Box 1391, and that's Monroe, Georgia 30655. Guys, we're going to sign off for today. Um, we sh we'll be back on tomorrow, and then we'll take a break on Wednesday. We will be back on Thursday and Friday for the most, and then we're going to sign off for the weekend and we may not be back on next week. Uh, I'll let you know more, but at least I know we'll be off Monday. Uh, my family line is going out of town, so uh, we won't be back until, I, I, I wanna say Tuesday or Wednesday, but we'll keep you updated on what's going on with that. But again, be looking for us on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday this week. We're gonna bring you some more podcasts. I don't know exactly what we're gonna be talking about yet. A lot of these things we pray about the night before and whatever the Lord puts on my heart, that's what we kind of just go with. And uh, so we'll, we'll have that up and ready for you. But until then, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, and may his countenance shine upon you in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the End Time Headlines podcast. We pray that you've been blessed and equipped by today's message. For more information about how you can help partner with our ministry, please visit endtimeheadlines.com dot org.